so Anthony, you're an author of several books about archaeology in the in Ireland and specific regions of Ireland, and also you've studied um, astronomy, archaeology, mythology, specifically relating to the Boyne Valley in Ireland. But one site that that's really captured your attention is Newgrange. Um, why has this site particularly captured your attention? Uh, well, I, I actually live very close to Newgrange, um, a four miles as the crow flies from my house here to Newgrange, which is west of me here. Um, I've lived in the Boyne Valley since I was born. Um, it's always been an, a, a, an object or a monument of intrigue for local people. Um, we've had this sort of fantastic uh, piece of prehistoric architecture uh, on our doorstep, and it's uh, it's captured the imagination from the point of view that it, uh, it retains a lot of mystery. And of course, it was excavated in the 60s and the 70s. Um, there's a lot of people still alive in Drogheda here and in other parts of the Boyne Valley who remember it before it was excavated, when it was covered in trees and it was just an old mound, you know. Um, and uh, since I was in school, I, I learned about prehistoric Ireland and the very, very rich heritage that we have. And as it happens, Newgrange has turned out to be probably the prime example of this type of monument that archaeologists call a passage tomb. Um, it's it's the most famous, uh, not just in terms of, you know, the number of people who visit there today, but also in Irish mythology and folklore. It's actually uh, Newgrange and its sister sites are the most revered and the most famous. So um, it's kind of it's natural for somebody who has a. Uh, uh, a curiosity that I have to investigate these things and that coupled with my interest in astronomy which is really what got me sparked off on all this uh, research over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. Okay great now you go if anyone goes to a tourist sort of website about New Grange they hear that it's a tomb or it's a passage grave or it's a burial ground um, but something you have said before is that 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 feature is actually of minor significance compared to its sort of astronomical features. Could you explain a bit about that? Of course, yeah. Newgrange is much more than a passage tomb. It's much more than a burial place. And that's not to denigrate the idea that it's a place connected with the dead and connected with the afterlife, not at all. But it, it's impractical on many fronts to suggest that it's merely a tomb and that's its only function. For instance, it, it is estimated that it took several generations of people to build Newgrange. There's 250,000 tonnes of earth on it. E each of the curbstones weighs, on average, three tonnes, which is the weight of an Asian elephant. Um, there are 97 curbstones and several other. There's about 200 of these very large stones which were hauled into place, uh, brought in from the coast at Clara Head uh, by boat um, up the River Boyne. So, there was a huge effort placed or, or put into the construction of Newgrange. And, of course, don't forget that Newgrange is only one of three major mounds in the Boyne Valley, the others being Nouth and Douth, and a smattering of other smaller mounds and sites as well. Its, its chamber is very small. Um, it's, it, it doesn't lend itself to mass burial. Uh, it's clear that if there was a burial function at Newgrange that it wasn't intended for the general community. In actual fact... When Professor Michael O'Kelly uh, excavated Newgrange in the 1960s, the remains of only five individuals were found. Now, that's not to say that bones weren't carted off uh, over the years, because Newgrange was actually rediscovered. The passage was rediscovered in 1699 by the then landowner, Charles Campbell. Um, so that's the practical side of it that you know you, you couldn't you couldn't envisage a, a mass burial site. The other thing is that you wouldn't go to effort. Uh, purely to bury somebody unless you know they were um, un unless they were of, of, of great significance in your community um, Newgrange is, has many many functions uh, I think and a lot, a lot of these functions are tied up with cosmology now it may be that that cosmology is tied up with some sort of a prehistoric belief system that saw you know um, Newgrange as a means of transferring, as it were, uh, or transporting the soul from this life to the next life. So when we look at a lot of ancient sites that have an astronomical 
feature. Sometimes they focus on one thing. Perhaps it's a calendar or it's used to measure solst the solstices. Um, however, with Newgrange, it seems like it has a multitude of functions. You know, it focuses on Venus, on um, the star constellation, different star constellations, Sirius, lunar cycles, equinoxes, solstices, procession, all of these things. <laughs> Um, can you just sort of focus in on what the main features are of Newgrange in a cosmological sense? Sure. Well, just to, to put it in perspective, April, um, the, the current belief in the academic world is that Newgrange was built to align to the winter solstice sunrise. Uh, that is a phenomenon that was rediscovered in 1967 by the then um, archaeologist Michael O'Kelly. It hadn't been witnessed in a long, long time, probably since prehistory. He had to he had to make repairs to the roof stones because over time the passage orthostats had leaned in and the roofing stones had sort of come down with settlement. And also a lot of cairn material had spilled out over the edge. Um, so basically Newgrange couldn't continue uh, this function until recent times. Now, that's where it stops with archaeologists and that's where guys like myself and Richard Moore come in, because we think that Newgrange is much more complex than this. Well, there's a very good reason for that. Firstly, if you're talking about an agrarian, an agricultural community establishing a calendar based purely on the sun, well, that is very impractical from the point of view that you cannot base a yearly calendar on the movements of the sun. It's too impractical because you have, you know, the sun standing still in summer, and moving along the horizon and then standing still in winter. And you have to try and measure out in between by calculating the number of days. It, it's much more practical to base a calendar on the sun and the moon, some of the planetary movements, and of course the stars. Because, you know, it, I've been studying astronomy since I was eight, and I spent a long number of hours under the stars as a child. And there's a couple of things that you realize after you do this for a time. And that is that you can tell the time of year and sometimes the time of night by watching what's going on in the sky. And I think this is something that the prehistoric people of the Boyne Valley knew inherently. This was part of common knowledge when they were growing up and would have been ta taught to them as a matter of course. You can't um, you can't function by watching the sun alone. Where Newgrange gets really interesting is um, it also admits light from the moon, um, specifically when the moon is located, you know, at the same declination as winter solstice sun. And in actual fact, this places the full moon opposite the summer solstice sun. So if a summer solstice full moon rising has the potential to illuminate the chamber of Newgrange. This is an astronomical fact. This isn't something that can be argued. Um, it's an astronomical fact that uh, quite often in its cycle, the moon occupies the same declination, the same position in the sky as winter solstice sun. But it gets much more exciting than that, because as you mentioned, uh, Newgrange is also aligned on the rising of Venus, but only on one day in eight years. And very curiously in that regard, is a local folk tale recorded by Joseph Campbell, the famous, um, well, he's a very, very famous uh, writer uh, on mythology um, and uh, who would have worked with George Lucas on the mythology behind the Star Wars films. And um, Campbell said in the 1950s that there was a belief at Newgrange that the light of the morning star shone into the chamber of Newgrange on one day in eight years, precisely at dawn, and that the beam of light illuminated a, a large basin, which was originally in the centre of the chamber of Newgrange. It's now been moved out of the centre of the chamber. That has two sort of, we call them, they're, they're called sockets, but they're like knee holes, as if you were supposed to kneel on the stone. Now, the curious thing about the Venus myth is that in 1958, when Campbell's book was published, uh, this couldn't have been witnessed, and that's because, as I was explaining, the roof slabs had come down, uh, uh, had sunk, as it were, had fallen uh, by quite a, a, an amount over the years with settlement. And the roof box, in actual fact, this aperture above the entrance of Newgrange, um, which is formed by two lintel stones, that was actually completely blocked up, and it had been blocked up for many years previous to the excavations. The earliest photographs of Newgrange and drawings from the 19th century show this roof box was actually completely blocked up. 
Mm. And the curious thing is, if it couldn't have been witnessed before 1967, and if the passage seems to have settled to the degree that the light was blocked off anyway, um, you have to go back to 1699 when Charles Campbell's land, uh, the landowner, his labourers were removing stone to build his mansion and his, his outbuildings. And that's how they dis- rediscovered the entrance of Newgrange. But the archaeologists tell us that in actual fact, um, this cairn slip that they call it, when the material of the mound fell down over the curbstones and the entrance, they tell us that this actually happened around 500 years after Newgrange was built, which would place this cairn collapse in the Bronze Age. Now, if that's the case, um, before 1699, you actually have to go right back to the Bronze Age to find Newgrange in a functional state. Now, if that's the case, how is it possible that in the 1950s in the Boyne Valley, there's a local person telling Joseph Campbell, well, you know that the light of the morning star shines in there into the chamber one day in eight years. Curious thing about it is when you study it using modern software, as most of us amateur astronomers can do now, you find that in actual fact, this is a very precise description astronomically. Venus follows an eight year cycle. Sometimes it's the morning star. Sometimes it's the evening star. And, you know, uh, we notice these things still today, despite our modern built up cities and our bright lights. People still phone into radio shows in Ireland when Venus appears as a morning star. What's that bright? big bright star in the morning and somebody from astronomy ireland or one of the uh, the astronomy groups here will go onto the radio saying oh that's venus that's the morning star this happens quite regularly but every time it happens people ring in it's like it's a, an unusual occurrence um but, but anyway the, myth, the the folklore says this is what happens and in actual fact astronomically it's an accurate description of what happens further to this there's a series of markings on the lintel stone above Newgrange, uh, which appear to be eight X-shaped markings. And in their book, Oriel's Machine, uh, Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas suggest that these are the eight years of the Venus cycle. Um, I'm very, very impressed with the idea that the folklore could have retained a function of Newgrange that was last visible about four or four and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, and that's it, incredible. It, yeah, it, it, it certainly is. In addition to that... Um, is the dog star Sirius and this is something that myself and Richard said in our book Island of the Setting Sun um, when we published it in 2006 um, that Newgrange was probably what we call a crude processional marker for the position of the dog star Sirius now just for non-astronomical viewers Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. It's one of the brightest objects after the sun, the moon, Venus and Jupiter. It's one of the brightest objects but it's the brightest star and i think that in the boyne valley around the time newgrange was built it just so happens that sirius shared this roughly the same declination as winter solstice sunrise so again uh, an observer in the chamber of newgrange is able to look at um is able to look at uh, out through the aperture from the chamber and see sirius passing uh, at night time and uh, probably on many occasions And gradually, in a couple of maybe a century or so, maybe a maximum of two centuries after Newgrange was built, due to the effects of precession of the equinox, Sirius is passing through the roof box. But as time goes on, it's getting higher and higher until eventually it's no longer visible from the chamber of Newgrange. Um, I think that the builders had all of that stuff figured out. But curiously, in relation to the dog star, there's a very interesting myth uh, if you stand at the front of Newgrange, and everybody stands at the front of Newgrange on winter solstice sunrise, because every every year people are allowed onto the site, and two or three hundred people turn up and watch watch the sun coming up, and it's magnificent, it's lovely. But what people don't do is in the evening time watch in the southwest when the sun is going down. And in actual fact, if they were to watch that, they would find the sun sets behind a hill in the southwest called Railtog. And Railtog is a word that means star. It's an Irish word for star. And there's a legend about the ring fort on the top of Railtog that says that there is gold buried in the ring fort guarded by a dog. And this has been interpreted quite accurately, I think, by the late William Battersby, who was a local folklorist and researcher who wrote several books about Newgrange and Nouth and other subjects. And Battersby proposed that in actual fact, this might be connected with the fact that, you know, the gold could be the sun setting on winter solstice. 
and the dog guarding the gold, of course, could be the dog star setting as viewed yes. from the screen. Yeah, that would make that would make a lot of sense. And I guess the question comes up: Why? I mean, there's a lot of focus on Venus. There's a lot of focus on Sirius. What do you think was their main reason for focusing in on these? Um, well. It doesn't end there, by the way. They are also very, very strongly focused on the Swan constellation Cygnus, and quite significantly, um, I, I, I'll be able to give you maybe a bit, a bit of an insight into why I think they were so interested in the sky and then in the particular objects. The passage and chamber of Newgrange are cross-shaped; they're cruciform. Um, they reflect accurately the shape of the cross-shaped constellation Cygnus. The mythology of Newgrange is very, very closely connected with swans, and in actual fact, the owner of Newgrange, Angus Angus Oak, um, well, basically, to cut a long story short, he has a dream about a a, 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 a beautiful woman, and um, he goes chasing after this woman because he's mad, madly in love with her, but she's only appeared to him in a dream. And eventually he finds her in the form of a swan. And in order to, to I suppose, receive her love, he has to take the shape of a, of a swan himself. And Angus transforms into a swan, and they both fly to Newgrange, where they presumably live happily ever after. And I think this is fascinating, not only because of Newgrange's shape, the internal shape of Newgrange, but because... Um, there are swans, whooper swans, that migrate to Ireland from Iceland during the winter time, and they appear at Newgrange every winter in very big numbers. Ornithologists, or bird watchers as we call them, are very excited about Newgrange. They say it's one of the larger wintering grounds for the whooper swans. And myself and Richard have always wondered whether maybe the swans have actually been coming here since prehistoric times, and that was the inspiration for so much swan mythology connected with Newgrange. Because also the other very famous character of Irish mythology is Cuchulain, the hero of the Tawn saga. Um, well, Cuchulain's mother came to Newgrange as a swan and was conceived of Cuchulain, or Setanta as he was known when he was a baby, uh, by the, the god Lu. Um, so there's, as I say, very significant swan mythology connected with the fact that there are swans in the valley. Also <coughs> interesting in that regard is the fact that at the time Newgrange was built, Cygnus was skimming the horizon in the north and rising up again. But at all other times in the procession, the processional cycle, and procession lasts almost 26,000 years, for most of that time, Cygnus is always visible from this latitude. So an observer at Newgrange, no matter what the century or the millennium, should be able to see Cygnus. But it just so happens that at the time Newgrange was built, Cygnus was doing this sort of swooping down to the horizon and grazing the horizon and coming back up again. And Newgrange points to another passage to him about 10 or 15 miles away called Fornox. And Fornox, in actual fact, in turn, points to the rising place of Deneb in, in 5,000 5, years ago, in 3,000 BC. Um, now, to get to your question about the reasons for this, uh, well, I think, first of all, the sky was held as sacred. I think that if you haven't got the modern scientific understanding of the heavens that we have, it would have been altogether quite mysterious. First of all, there was the calendrical um, aspect. They wanted to keep time, and they did that by watching the sun, the moon, the planets, and, you know, the slow movement of the stars. I think it wouldn't have taken them too long, maybe a couple of generations, to figure out the procession of the equinoxes cycle that seemed to have been gradually moving the positions of the stars. But further to that is that in folklore, the Irish other world is often said to lie in the direction of the setting sun, as if, you know, when the sun sets, that's when the stars come out. Um, the other world uh, could be seen as a place that lies among the stars. Uh, Newgrange is a very liminal place in mythology. It is the place to which the Tuatha de Danann, who are, by the way, the gods, uh, the prehistoric gods who are most strongly connected with the monuments, with the mounds. They were called the Shi, and they were seen as portals to the other world. They were the means by which the immortal gods, and this is the Dagda and Angus and Boan and, uh, you know, Agma, um, and all of this pantheon of gods who were associated with the monuments could actually migrate between this world and the next world using the mounds. And I think that actually gives us an insight as to what the real function of Newgrange might have been, that it wasn't just somewhere 
you buried somebody and deposited bones that in actual fact it was very much seen as a place uh, where you know when this life ended that the soul basically transported uh, to the other realm which as i said lies in the direction of the sun uh, beyond the stars that sort of thing and you've raised a really important point about this um, I've seen in, in some of your writing where you've said that in order to really understand this complex, incredibly complex site, you have to really have an understanding of archaeology, astronomy, mythology, spirituality, all kinds of disciplines because if you just focus on archaeology, you miss the whole linkage with the, the stars and the planets. If you just focus on astronomy, you don't know about the mytho mythological background, the folklore, all of those things. And I just want to quote one thing you said, which I think sums it up really, really well, where you say, it was only where stars, stones and stories combined that we were able to see a larger picture emerging. Um, I think that summarizes it really well. Uh, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, well, of course I do. They're my words, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason for that, you see, um, archaeologists acknowledge that, and I've said this in my latest book, Newgrange Monument Immortality, um, you know, a lot of people who come at this area criticize archaeologists. I have a lot of friends who are archaeologists. I've actually taken part in some archaeological digs. I think that we we misunderstand them to an extent. Archaeologists understand that the phrase or the word passage tomb doesn't really describe what the function of Newgrange is. They will acknowledge this. They know there's a shortcoming uh, in that regard. They don't accept uh, folklore and mythology as being a, a uh, you know scientific data with which mm -hmm. time is a site. That's understandable. Um, the advantage of being, I suppose, an outsider uh, to an extent, I mean, my background is in journalism. My career has been in newspaper journalism. And, you know, uh, as a journal of the facts, I'm taught a lot of things. I'm taught to follow the facts, make observations. Um, when you're writing your stories for a newspaper, you have to be accurate. You also have to be fair and balanced. Uh, you have to try and see it from, you know, different perspectives uh, so that you're not presenting a biased uh, view unless of course that's an opinion piece in which case that's your own opinion and some of what I've written is my own opinion but largely um, when I've kind of approached this subject I've seen that you you, you have to have a cognizance of a multitude of disciplines in order to see that picture emerge and they would include as you've mentioned you know as well as archaeology astronomy and mythology would be the, the key ones an aspect of spirituality and um, the difficulty with some of these things is that you know there's a certain amount of subjectivity involved um where i arrive my work i think i've held my hands up and admitted that you know i i'm being entirely subjective here uh, where i'm being objective i think i've been honest enough as well um i don't think that archaeologists will ever be able to answer the question properly as to what Newgrange and Nouth and Douth and all of these wonderful sites were about. However, I'm not claiming that I'm going to be the one to answer those questions. In actual fact, um, I facilitated, I think, more questions to be asked and perhaps stimulated debate around those questions. Because if Newgrange is astronomically aligned, as the archaeologists accept wholly that it is, well then, for instance, at nearby Douth, there's an alignment to winter solstice sunset. And then you could ask, well, is that intentional? If that's intentional, then there's two monuments. At Cairn T and Loch Crew in 1980, Martin Brennan and Jack Roberts discovered that uh, its passage and chamber were aligned to the sunrise on the spring and autumn equinoxes. So there's three sites. And if you accept that there's an astronomical function of three sites, then you begin to say, well, is this a systematic thing? Of course, there are plenty of sites for, for which astronomical alignments aren't always immediately clear and where, you know, the approach to suggest that there are alignments has been in some cases um, maybe a little bit subjective and maybe lacking in hard data and all the rest. But if you have stories, as we have at Newgrange, and this is the clearest example, if you have a story that was recorded in the 1950s that says, this is what happens here. The, the morning star shines into Newgrange one day in eight years. 
if that then turns out to be an accurate astronomical description of what happens, and if in fact, now I have to tell you that I don't think Venus has been observed by the archaeological community. Uh, I know one individual who was a part of Martin Brennan's research team, Hank Harrison, mentioned to me uh, as much as 13 years ago, I think in the year 2000, Hank told me that he had witnessed Venus from the chamber of Newgrange. So it, ha it has been witnessed in modern times, but not by the archaeological community. And I think that, you know, when they're open enough to the idea of watching a full moon shine into Newgrange, and watching a uh, you know a rising of Venus shine into Newgrange, they may begin to see it from a different perspective. the The story is the killer punch for me. How could a story exist in the nineteen fifties relating to something that couldn't be witnessed at that time, mm. nor for a long time previous to that? Um, unless, I mean, you know, it's 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 a total mystery from that point of view, and there are many mysteries because. In, in, in Island of the Setting Sun, for instance, um, I, I've explored the, the myth of doubt, which appears to describe a total eclipse of the sun. And doubt's name is darkness, which is connected with the, you know, the sudden darkness that was said to have happened in the mythology of doubt when it was being built. And in actual fact, uh, my study of doubt with Richard Moore has revealed that doubt would seem to be ha have been used as a site where you studied the moon swing cycle and therefore you would be studying the cycle of eclipses because eclipses happen in predictable cycles. And a lot of people don't actually know that. Eclipses actually happen, lunar eclipses happen in predictable cycles. I think they had it f figured out and I think that the mythology leans towards that. Whether other people accept that um, interpretation of the mythology is another question. It's it's really amazing how with all the technology we have now, all our measuring equipment and high-tech devices, we still don't have all the answers to these sites. Um, and, you know, how our ancient ancestors, you know, 5,000 or more years ago had this incredible knowledge um, without these devices that, you know, we have today. But at least your work is starting to put together the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and hopefully one day we'll have the complete picture about you know what these sites were really all about. Well I always say that um, we, we may eventually invent time travel and if we can that'll be an interesting experiment to go back <laughs> to New Grange and try to communicate with the people yeah. who are building it and try to get into their mindsets. Um, uh, unfortunately a lot of people especially um, you know archaeologists for instance um, you know, they they don't regard the mythology as being, you know, evidence, as I said. They don't really understand, I think, or accept the complex astronomical functions that have been proposed for Newgrange and other sites. Um, however, there's a, a clear shortfall in their own explanation of what Newgrange is about. But then you get other people who are interested in, for instance, ley lines, energy and spirituality, acoustics, all sorts of stuff. And uh, to be honest with you, and the archaeologists are sceptical of all this, and they're right to be, because some people who come to study this subject seem quite kind of detached from reality, um, while as, whereas others seem to have, you know, quite genuine theories as to what they might be about. There's, of course, the theory that a lot of these ancient sites were built with the help of aliens, um, and that's something that, I mean, I I haven't seen any evidence for them. I mean, I'm very open-minded about the possibility of extraterrestrial life. I don't understand why they would come here to help um, prehistoric people haul these stones into place. But one of the things that's worth bearing in mind about Newgrange, and one of the things that makes it such a beautiful place to visit, is the mystery that still holds for us. Because I think the day we have all of the answers about what it was about, and the day when we declare this is exactly what Newgrange's functions were and these are the reasons for its uh, construction, it will cease to be mysterious to us and I think largely it will probably cease to be interesting to us. Yes. Uh, dis despite our mastery of technology, despite all the wonderful things that we can do with technology, we are still in awe of what these people did and we're, we're still struggling to figure out the motivations and the means uh, by which they did it, and in some cases the materials they used. 
Yes, yeah, that's right. Well, Anthony, thanks so much for sharing your insight into New Grange. It's really fascinating information. And if um, someone wants to find out more about this site, how would they do that? Uh, well, my website is www.mythicalireland.com and it's basically been there since almost since myself and Richard Moore started researching all this stuff in 1999. Um, if you want to look at my books, um, our first book was, well, my the one I wrote with Richard is Island of the Setting Sun in Search of Ireland's Ancient Astronomers. It's available on Amazon or the Liffey Press is the publisher. Uh, republished in, it was first published in 2006, republished 2008. My latest book is New Grange Monument to Immortality, uh, also Liffey Press, uh, available again on Amazon and on the Liffey Press website. Um, and I will be producing more work. I'm currently working on two uh, uh, books, which I hope uh, will be published in the next uh, between six and 12 months. So I suppose keep an eye on watch this space, as it were. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much.